Are you tired of being overcharged and forced into paying a monthly subscription for your Mac and Windows software? Well, if you are, currently we're having a 50% off discount on all the latest Mac and Windows software, such as AutoCAD, SolidWorks, Photoshop, Microsoft Office, and much more. Our 50% off discount will be ending soon, so be sure to text us, ready to buy, to the number on the screen. Starting pricing for low-end software $100 and starting pricing for high-end software $500. We aim to please, so expect 24-7 technical support, the latest premium software, instant software links delivered to your email, and PayPal Buyer's Protection Guarantee. Racism is the most powerful system on the planet, yet it is often perceived as the most taboo subject to discuss. World-renowned activist and best-selling author Tariq Nasheed takes on this challenge head-on in his new book, Foundational Black American Race Baiter. This is the most important book you will need in order to understand the mechanisms of systemic racism and how to counter this system. Get Foundational Black American Race Baiter now at Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com. Also get limited autographed collector's editions of the book at OfficialFBA.com. What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Tariq Radio. I am your gracious host. My name is Tariq Nasheed. Glad to have everybody tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to chop up some good game on today's broadcast. Let everybody know that we're live right now, ladies and gentlemen, doing our thing. Retweet this, repost this on your Facebook and some of your other platforms ladies and gentlemen and hit that subscribe button please make sure you hit that subscribe button because we're going to chop up some very good game on today's broadcast what we're going to do while everybody's piling in we're going to take a very very quick commercial break and i mean it's going to be very very quick so don't you move a muscle ladies and gentlemen because we will be right back on Tariq radio don't move a muscle listen up squares you need to get the legendary book on game the art of mackin by author Tariq King Flex Nasheed. Available on Amazon right now. Can you dig it? This book has been a bestseller for 20 years, Jack. And the New York Times called it a classic. That means it's out of sight. So this book ain't for no lames who ain't trying to learn the game. Jive turkeys. So if you're ready to stop slacking in your macking, Get the Art of Mac and Book on Amazon and Barnes and Noble right now. Sucker. Rated PG. That stands for plenty of game. Jar chumps. Bro, stop playing and start spraying. Leave an op on the ground where you stand. At all costs, yeah, make sure you protect it. Old goon juice, the formula been tested. You can defend yourself. If you find that you need a little help, gotta stay ready. Ain't no love in the street. Pepper spray straight to the face, make them get weak. Get it at ogunjuice.com. If they think it, you slipping, then tell them to come get them some. If you packing this, you won't be lacking. But shot to the eye in them problems you have it. Maximal strip, hit them haters on ground. So you can feel free when you out in the town. Ogun juice and don't forget a shirt, man. You gotta stay ready, that evil on lurk. Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. You are now tuned into the legendary OG. OG. Tariq Nasheed. I was up on this to all my friends. On Tariq Radio. 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 Where is Tariq getting all this cash? All right, we are back, and I'm Tariq. I am your gracious host, Tariq Nasheed. Thank you guys for tuning in. We're live. I told you the commercial break was going to be real quick. It wasn't going to be long. But we're here. How y'all doing, man? I'm glad everybody's here. I know I'm doing this sh the main show a little late in the week, but I'm here. Better late than never. Glad to have y'all in here. I need everybody, first of all, to again subscribe. Hit that subscribe button. 
and then hit that bell notification so that you are notified when I'm doing a live, ladies and gentlemen. You know? Let everybody know when you hit that subscribe button and then you hit that bell notification that lets folks know when I am live. So a lot we got to talk about today. We're going to talk about a lot of game today. Um, shout out to all my moderators in the room. Oh, yeah, by the way, FYI, family, the root work. A lot of people have been asking, when are we going to stock back up on the root work? The root work will be back in stock next week. So you guys will be good to go. So hang tight. People love the root work deodorant, the natural root work deodorant, foundational black American themed deodorant. And that will be back in stock next week. So we'll be back ready to roll. So I keep you guys posted on that. Um, this weekend, the Colorado game is this weekend, right? Our good brother, Coach Prime, doing phenomenal things out there in Colorado. Um, I can't wait to see the game. A lot of people are going to be tuning into that because Coach Dion is right now, Coach Prime rather, is carrying college football on his shoulders right now. That brother has made the game, college football, more exciting than ever. Um, it's generating so much money. Do y'all know out there in Colorado, I think they said the last game they had, they that brought in like for the whole, that city over there. I don't know if it was for the city or for the state, but they said they that generated about $18 million in one weekend. The the hype and everything around that game. You know, just the, the city out there made so much money because all eyes are on the people out there in Colorado and some of the places out there. So Dion is doing phenomenal things. And I want people to understand, folks, you know, they, they know that we can get things popping as black folks, especially foundational black Americans. Somebody said money for white people. Yeah, they'll like the money, but they still don't like the fact that it's a black man who they kind of have to depend on to make it hot like that. You dig? Even when the odds are against them and, you know, when we get in the mix, we make things so hot and so fly uh, they it, it's a gift and a curse yeah we're making money but damn we got an uppity negro and that uppity negro might be contagious see that's the thing yeah my brother is still underpaid Dion, well they need to be breaking him off he's still underpaid those white coaches be getting 75 80 million dollars a year and you know what's Dion getting 24 million I don't know what he's getting but it's not what the white ones are getting and he needs to get way more that man is carrying the game and the franchise on his shoulders right now yeah somebody's saying those tickets are NFL high when if they play out here I think they're going to play out here with UCLA in Pasadena I think in October I don't know but I, I would like to go that's how you know, it's I, I want to go. I'm waiting on those tickets to go to sell, go go on sale. But let me tell you something. Even though they're smiling and skinning and grinning, do you? I want y'all to understand something deep down. Well, they want the some of the people in the dominant society. They would love for Dion to lose. Even though he's generating all of this money, because he's the hottest thing in college sports right now. They would love for him to lose right now. They're secretly praying that one of these white coaches can whip a team into shape to make Dion's team lose because he goes out here and tells them what he's going to do and then follows through with confidence and swag. And they hate when we do it like that because that gets very contagious that's why you had some of those sports commentators talking about, you know, I'm going to, when they play Nebraska, I'm going to be rooting for Nebraska. You know, I'm just Dion out. You know, a lot of them feel like that. Yeah, the Jason Whitlocks and all of that. Well, Dion should be humble. You know, if he's a Christian, the Bible says be humble. Now, what kind of Sambo talk is that? See, they hate when we win, when black folks are winning, and we're, we're whooping folks fair and square. There's this thing where we're supposed to be humble. We're not supposed to gloat about it. That goes back to that Jack Johnson thing 
when Jack Johnson used to beat white players back in the day, the early 1900s, they would tell him not to smile. They said, Jack, if you knock the white man out, don't smile. We're not going to like that. That's that whole thing. You got to humble yourself. You got to, if you beat us, you better humble yourself and just have some decorum. Don't brag about it. You're supposed to kind of bow your head and be, yes, a boss. I saw I had to beat you, but you still the boss now. They, they want you to have that kind of mindset. You dig? It's only with us. Yeah, yeah. That's why I love Muhammad Ali so much. Muhammad Ali like, no, I'm the greatest. I'm not going to bow my head and be humble. I'm the greatest. I'm the prettiest. And I'm the best who ever did it. And he was so inspirational to so many people. That's why they had to try to get him um, outside of the ring, trying to put those charges on him to, to try to put him in jail because of draft dodging and all of that stuff. You see? That's why they got to get the Floyd Mayweathers and put these weird charges on them. You know, they got to throw them in jail for these frivolous charges. They can't beat you. It's just Mike Tyson. We can't beat you in the ring, but we're going to beat you outside of the ring. You see? Yeah, Joe Lewis, don't smile. They told Joe Lewis that too. Don't smile. Yeah. So one of these, they were talking about the upcoming game and you had one of their little sambos out here and the white people sitting here co-signing and clapping and applauding, talking about Dion, talking about how this dude was taking a personal shot at Coach Prime talking about how my mom taught me to take your glasses and hat off because Dion, when he does the press conferences, he he kind of gloats on him. He wears his shades, wears his hat. He, he does him. So you know when people are salty, they start making little personal insults like this. Hold on one second. L listen to this. And I sat on with the ESPN today, and I don't care if they hear it in Boulder. I told them I took my hat off, and I took my glasses off, and I said, when I talk to grown-ups, I take my hat and my glasses off. That's what my mother taught me. So, and I sat on with the ESPN today, and I don't care if they hear it in Boulder. I told them I took my hat off, and I took my glasses off, and I said, when I talk to grown-ups, I take my hat and my glasses off. That's what my mother taught me. So, okay, so this guy, I think he's a biracial coach, but you know he has a um, um, a Karen wife. So, and and li listen to the white people applauding that. I want you to, yeah. I take my hat, and my glasses off. Yeah, when I, my mama taught me when I talk to adults, when I talk to grown ups, take my glasses and my hat. Yeah, stop. This is desperate. I hope Dion's team beat the brakes off them. Hating for no damn reason. This is this is desperate. You dig? This is desperation when they start taking it. His mom is white, uh huh? Yeah, when they start taking these little personal shots and listen to the white people applauding. That's the thing that's inter interesting. But yeah, they don't want, when black excellence is in the room, they want you to be humble when you are a representation of black excellence. Now, if you are a degenerate, they want you to be as arrogant of a degenerate as possible. And that brings us to what you see on the screen. When the white media portrays black people and black women and black men or whoever as complete degenerates, they want you to be as arrogant and as cocky about your degeneracy as possible. They have no problem with you being confident about being a slut a disgrace, a degenerate, a riffraff. They have no problem with that. Be as cocky as possible. Now, they just had the VMAs Awards, and I was talking about this the other day. One thing I noticed, and I'm not going to play the clip, some of these, you know, they got these female rappers out here, and, and we better understand why they portray certain things a certain way. Yeah, like Lizzo. They love a confident degenerate like Lizzo, somebody who's showing flat ass, wide, big, flat TV screen ass and shaking it around. They want you to be as confident as possible about that. But the thing is, when you look at these shows and look at the, the white run music industry and why they show and portray certain things, they do things for rhyme and reason. 
everything they don't do things and just leave it up to chance they don't they don't leave it up to chance and right now they're promoting a lot of the female rappers but the the thing is we'll promote you but you have to be a complete degenerate if we promote you we have to promote you as being a complete damn degenerate and we'll give you the biggest budget you need and we'll give you the biggest platform you need. And we got to understand the rhyme and reason as to why. Why are they doing that? Now, some people say, well, why don't you blame the performers? Why don't you blame the Sukihanas? Why are you making it the, the fault of the white people? It's their fault because the white supremacist suspects, they're giving them a platform. That's who I'm putting the onus on. We're always going to have degenerates. You go down to any whole stroll and you know, somebody's going to do some degenerate. You go down to a crack spot or a trap. There's going to be some degenerate stuff down there. That's a given in any society. The thing is, why are you putting a camera in front of that and putting a budget behind it? That's what I want to know. Because you can go to any culture and find their degenerate society. You know what? In fact, there's a brother on Instagram and TikTok and his page keeps getting taken down because what this brother does, he finds these videos from all of these third world countries and shows all the weird, nasty stuff that they do with their food. And he does like kind of funny commentary on it. I forgot the brother's name. My wife, my wife showed me his page and he, he gets his page taken down all the time. They keep reporting his page. He does to them what they do to us. What World Star and Shade Room and Hollywood Unlocked and all of these bossips, they show degenerate behavior in Black American society and make a grip off of it. This brother shows like in India and East Africa and the Middle East and some of these countries where they do real weird stuff with the way they cook food and their their, their hands are dirty and they're spitting in food and making food, putting the food under their arms and stepping on the food with their feet. He's like, damn, what the hell are they doing? So he's showing some of the underbelly of these other societies and he gets his page taken down all the time. Those people, yes, yeah, super, what's his name? Supare? Yes, yeah, somebody said it. Yes, he's funny. Yes, that brother is funny. I wish I could play some of the stuff now, but they'll probably take it down. Supare, that's his name. Yeah, my wife put me onto that guy. He's funny. And these people are, they do some nasty stuff with the way, just some of the regular everyday stuff that they do with their food and my dude be clowning them. It's like, damn, what, what the hell is that? They get his page taken down all the time. They don't like putting a spotlight on that. N none of these people like showing the underbelly. I won't even say underbelly. Let me let me be let me back it up. Let me back that up a minute. I won't even say underbelly of their society. That's the normalized part of their society, to be honest. Let, let me let me keep it a buck here. Because I've been to some of those countries, and if you walk down the street, to be honest, that's how they prepare food. When you go to these countries, you don't really have to go to the hood part. If you go to the downtown area, you see people out there cooking bugs and preparing the food in a real in a in a very weird way and it's a lot of filth and dirt and grime and that's just kind of how it is in some of these spots to be honest i can't even say that's the underbelly of their society that's the normalized part of their society to be honest let's keep it a buck hell you know i remember when i went to south africa and a lot of people who were from south africa but living in other places they kind of got upset because I was just walking around filming normal stuff. I was walking around filming normal stuff. I was going to the townships, which is where the many of the black people live. And I'm like, damn, it's kind of uh, it's kind of funny style over here. And people were like, damn, why are you showing that nigga? Why are you showing us like that? I'm like, shit, I'm looking for the middle class of the rich black spots and I can't find them. Yeah, but when you go to certain uh, some of these third world countries, dude, they be cooking lizards and rats and bugs, big giant beetles and people be peeing in the street and shitting in the street. It's it, that's normalized and they don't like showing it. You see what I'm saying? They don't like you putting a spotlight on that. 
Now, you can say, well, damn it, the people should know better not to do it. Yeah, you know, people do what they do. But also, why would you want to put a spotlight on that and put a big budget behind it? I can see somebody doing a kind of a commentary, a humorous commentary. He's not putting a budget behind it. This brother, the Super Ray guy, is just kind of making um, funny commentary about some of the culture there. But over here, corporations put billions of dollars in showing and promoting black degeneracy. So that's different. That's a whole different thing. Now, why? We got to understand why are they doing that? You know, not just to make money, but in that is used to control a population and control the image of that population. Now, let, let's be real. I'm not no prude. You know, I like a little ratchetness here and there. I like a little raunchiness here and there, but that has there has to be a rhyme and reason for it. We in our society in foundation of black American society, we've had raunchy stuff within our society, but there was a rhyme and reason for it. And there was a place for it, even in the entertainment industry. We had people going back to the 1920s, like Josephine Baker. Some people thought that her act was kind of raunchy, but it was more provocative. Yeah, she did the, the sexy dance with the banana dress on and she did a lot of sexy stuff and a lot of provocative stuff. And she went over to France and made a lot of money and did her thing. Um, but the thing is, Josephine Baker did a lot for the civil rights movement. She actually helped a lot of black people. And in fact, I think um, Coretta Scott King and those guys were trying to make her um, some kind of brand ambassador from what I understand. So but um, hold on one second. Hold on. My, they texting me something at the museum. Hold on. Hold on one second. Um, hold on one second. Hold on one second. Okay. Sorry about that. Some, they texted me some at the museum. Um, yeah, I think the architects, some people at the museum doing some architectural stuff. Hold on one second. What is this? Oh, somebody wants. Oh, okay. Hold on. Shit. If somebody came to the museum, they want to do the architecture work for free. Okay, hold on. Now let me let me check this out for a minute. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. Yeah, somebody's at the museum right now. Some brother, shout out to this brother. So there's a brother who came through. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm um for the, for those who don't know, um, there was some stuff going on with the museum. They're making us the city is doing some stuff. LAPD is making us get these permits. You know, they're really throwing a lot of red tape at us. We've been having our events at the museum, and the museum has been really popping. So now the LAPD was like, hey, hold on a minute now. Y'all got to get some other permits. You got to get these kind of permits and whoop-de-whoop and then they sent us downtown to the building in um, code um, office. And then they told us we got to get some blueprints. And then the blueprint people and the architects are trying to charge a gazillion dollars and whoop de whoop. So, yeah, some brothers up there now, people are coming through like, hey, we heard the situation, man. I'm an architect and we can do it for free. And they're hitting me up now. So, yeah, shout out to them. I'm a hot, When I'm done with the broadcast today, I'm going to holler at them. Shout out to them. I love that. I love that. Shout out to the family. That's what we need. That's some on code stuff. Somebody said it's a Nigerian scammer. <laughs> no, no, they sent me the brother's name. It sounds like an FBA name. So, yes. Yes. Yeah, I got. Yeah, we got you. As you if you've been to the museum, y'all know we got same gender bathrooms. That, that It's a California thing, man. Yeah, we, we do have same gender bathrooms. That's kind of some shit that, you know, y'all know how it is out here. But yeah, shout out to that brother. When I'm done, I'm going to hit that brother up because that brother wants to do the architectural work for free. And I love that. Shout out to that brother there, man. Yeah, yeah. Somebody said, hopefully he's not an agent. Yeah, yeah. yeah hopefully he's cool. But yes. I love that. Shout out to that. Shout out to somebody said, check his hairline, <laughs> man. But anyway, but like I'm saying, like I'm, let's go back to what I'm saying. Let's get back to what I'm saying here. There's a, we, we've had raunchiness. Like I said, Josephine Baker, she did a lot for the black community. We had 
female entertainers who were raunchy with their act, but they they were doing it in the realm of comedy. Like Moms of Mabley was kind of raunchy to by her standards. LaWanda Page was kind of raunchy. People like Millie Jackson, she was an entertainer artist, um, used to do a version of rap basically on her early records. Did a lot of sexualized lyrics, but it was in the realm of comedy. It was comedic. You know, it was in the whole vein of the dozen. So we we did it in a comedic way. Um, even going into the the 90s when we started having some of the female rappers become more sexualized, like the Foxy Browns or the, the Little Kims, they were being provocative in order to actually give off certain levels of sex appeal they were trying to be sexy there was a rhyme and reason they were like look you know I'm kind of a hood chick but I can be sexy too but I can be a hood chick and sexy there was a rhyme and reason for it what we have now this is that's not sexy I'm just look at what you look at the screen this isn't sexy that's that's not even sexually provocative. That's not even that's not even meant to turn you on. You, you know what I'm saying? That's not a turn on. That's not a turn on at all. There's nothing sexually alluring about that. You know, the chicks bending over, one chick laying on a dirty floor with her tongue out like a dog, and they got these goofy outfits on and one chick back is ashy and oily and the other chick throwing up the fu fingers. That's that's not sexy. I mean, just look at this picture. There's nothing sexually alluring about it. And VH1 had these folks up here and gave them a platform to get on the, the red carpet. Now, it looks like they had a, a separate red carpet in the back somewhere, but those pictures still go out. You understand? What's the rhyme and reason for this other than to paint a narrative for black women? And when the image of black women is degenerated, then that degenerates the image of the family because the black woman is the glue to the family because that's the first teacher. The the children are going to absorb that degeneracy. You understand? This is not a, a sexy image in any sense of the word. And when you look at Suki, and I've talked about her a lot. This is her tweet about it. And she said something very interesting. She said, first time at the VMAs, they knew how who I was when they invited me, which is true, which is actually true. They knew, well, yeah, let me turn this yeah. down. They knew she was going to get on the floor like this, like a damn dog and roll around and and act like a degenerate slut. They knew that. And look that and look what it looks like it's in a back room somewhere. It's not the main red carpet. That looks like it's in a back room somewhere where they had another step and repeat VH1 sign. But that image has been shown all over the world of her rolling around on the floor like a dog like that. You, you see? They don't want they won't show a white woman like this. They know better than to show a white woman acting like a super slut like like this because they know the image that it will give to younger white girls. So there's a reason why they show this. Why the, the white media is platforming this. There's a reason why. And then we go to the people like Sexy Red. They just gave Sexy, Sexy Red just had a number one um, joint on TikTok. Billboard has a new TikTok chart. And um, Sexy Red, her song, Pound Town, became number one on the TikTok charts. And with Sexy Red, that's another one. They have her doing this degenerate stuff. Her image is being the super hood rat. And basically her and Sookie, they portray them and parade them around in the media to have them say and do the most degenerate stuff imaginable. Her and Glorilla, all of them, Whenever they do interviews, everything is all about how they can out degenerate each other. And it's not even sexy. They talking about their STDs and 
licking dudes' asses and all of this stuff. Shout out to Daily Wrap Up Crew. Shout out to Daily Wrap Up Crew. Um, but here's an interview that Sexy Red did. This is performative. I don't believe what she's saying. She said the most romantic thing a dude ever did for her was rob somebody and give her the money. I don't believe that. I think this is just performative degeneracy. Her saying something just to sound like a degenerate. L listen to this. Listen to this. Hold on. Hold on. Well, I'm be honest. The most romantic thing somebody did for me, it was my first boyfriend. I was just in high school. He was a little older than me. And it was Valentine's Day. I'll never forget. He robbed somebody and gave me the money and gave me the bill he stole. And it was just so sweet because he was out of breath and stuff. He's like, here, I just got this for you. I was like, oh, so sweet. Thank you. Because nobody never did nothing like that for me. He stole for me. So I'm like, oh, you did that for me, really? I was like, I was 15. Yeah, 15. That was my first boyfriend. And that's the first time somebody ever had got me a gift or tried to do something for me. And I know he didn't have it. So the fact that you still made a way and you did what you had to do, that was nice. And it was only $13. But it was nice. <laughs> and it was a fake Gucci belt. <laughs> okay. So they had talking about how... It was romantic that she had a dude went and robbed somebody for her. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. That doesn't even sound practical. That 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 sounds stupid as hell. That's all cap. Yeah, I, I'm the. It was so romantic. It, I, I'm so glad he made away from me. That's something that some white execs said. Go out here and say that. And you know that's gonna. That's going to kind of pump up your image as the super hood rat. And also that's going to justify some of the anti-black racism that the white supremacist society have that culturally this degenerate stuff within black society is normalized. I don't believe nothing she said in that. That's to give the impression that that kind of degeneracy is a normalized thing where we think robbing is romantic so that a white supremacist watching this will be like oh god see look at them those niggers think that robbing people is sexy oh my god I don't believe that at all I believe that some some white execs told her to say that nonsense somebody I don't believe somebody went and robbed somebody for $13 and gave her the money I, I just don't believe that but again, they keep promoting this stuff for a reason. To degenerate the image of black women. And you got to be very careful with co-signing this stuff because there is a backlash to it. I want y'all to understand there is a direct correlation with neglect for black girls because they want you to know there was a, there's still a lot of black girls who end up missing. And when we see stories of black girls who end up missing and then a, a, a black woman does a hoax of getting kidnapped and then they promote the hoax, again, that's another way for them to minimize what happens to black girls and black women. You understand? Now, that story brings us to this story that happened out here in California because there's a direct correlation to stories like this. There was a 13-year-old black girl walking home with some of her, I think, Hispanic friends from school. She's 13 years old. And the girl goes to a McDonald's with her friends, with her non-black friends, and then some Hispanic woman who looks at, I think she's Hispanic, comes in and just unprovoked starts beating on the little black girl. Just unprovoked. And the thing is, all of the other white kids, nobody did anything. I want y'all to look at this. I want y'all to look at this. This is interesting. Because nobody did anything. That's the part that's killing to me. Not just the, the anti-black racist woman beating on this child, but the fact that nobody did anything about it. Now listen to this. Hold on. Hold on. A 13-year-old girl violently attacked inside a fast food restaurant. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Amy Johnson. And I'm Juan Fernandez. The teen says the beating was sudden and surprising. And yeah, she spoke with KCAL News reporter Rachel Kim about the terrifying ordeal. 
It was all about surviving and making sure that I was not injured in the worst way possible. 13-year-old Cassidy Jones explains what was racing through her mind as she endured a vicious beating by a woman she doesn't even know at this Harbor City McDonald's. People there watched and recorded what Cassidy calls an unprovoked attack. Very horrific, very bad. Cassidy tells us she and two classmates stopped at this McDonald's on their way home from school on September 6th. She says when she stepped out of the restroom, the unidentified woman immediately made eye contact with her and cornered her. The lady, she was like, um, what the F are you looking at? I fight kids, I fight you. I said, can you get your hand on my face? She moves it closer, and that's when I go like this. And then she grabs me and she starts manhandling me. And it's like, I didn't do anything to her. The eighth grader said when she asked the woman to let her go, the woman tightened her grip. I mean, the only way um, I got her to let go of me was to hit her, and that's when she started um, punching me in my face. It looks like the black girl was the only black person in the whole store, by the way. I don't see any other black people. I want y'all to keep that in mind. And she tried swinging me. She was grabbing me by my hair and stuff. And then she yanked me to the floor, like swung me like a rag doll. The attack ended when a man who was with the woman pulled her off of Cassidy. The and that dude looked like he's Pacific Island or something. He don't look black. He was left with cuts, bruises, swelling to her face, and emotional trauma. I could not believe it. I'm thinking it had to be an animal that would attack a 13-year-old, you know, someone mentally disturbed. Angelina Gray was heartbroken to see her daughter, a 4.0 honor roll student, beaten up so badly. She's outraged and is hoping someone will identify the woman in the video. She should go to jail. Okay, she, she should lose her children, okay, and any job that she has, she should lose that as well. If anyone knows this lady. Where my Long Beach folks at? My Harbor City folks at? Where, where y'all at? Y'all know that woman? Please turn her in. The LAPD says no arrests have been made so far, but the woman will face child abuse and battery charges. I will just ask her why. That's it. There's no excuse. Rachel Kim, KCAL News. Oh, boy. Boy, boy, boy. Man, man, family. Family. A few things. A few things with this. First of all, the, the little black girl, this is an, an honor roll student. And this big back behemoth just ran up on this little child unprovoked and started wailing on this kid. And the problem is all the other people in that store let it happen. They didn't do anything about it. See, they all got on code. They all got on code. Some people said the chick might be Samoan. Who knows? The dude looked like he might be Samoan or whatever, but that chick might be Hispanic. Who knows? She's non-black. Now, the thing is, I want y'all to understand there's a direct correlation between that random assault and what you see on screen. Because the thing is, they show black women like this as less than like animals or whatever. And that they give people a daily dose of this, of black female hood. And then you show the sexy reds and the glorillas. And remember, sexy red and glorilla, they look like teenagers. They look like they look young. You ding? So you're inundated with images of young degenerate girls who are supposed to be less than. So now you got this black girl who's by herself, who's an honor roll student. She, the black girl has nothing to do with what you see on screen, but in a system of anti-black racism, you have these people running around here harboring this anti-black hate and they're looking to justify their anti-black hate. This is why we can't be out here vulnerable. We can't leave our kids out here. Look, these non-black people like this big back behemoth and some of the white supremacists and the wannabe white supremacists, these are big fucking cowards. They can't step to the black men and women, the adults. When they try to pull that stuff on the black adults, you know, they get some of that Montgomery chair action. They know they cannot step to us. 
They know they can't run up on us to um, display and justify their anti-black racism. They know we're going to put all types of hands on them. And they know they can't do that type of stuff when adults are around. I wish you would do some shit like that to a black kid and I'm there. And I'm not trying to be Billy Badass, but they they know who and where to pull that type of stuff. There were no black adults around. There were no black people around for her to pull that. They can see when the coast is clear. And we got to be very clear about where we have our children. We don't put our children around their little white buddies and Hispanic buddies and not give them the game. We have to let our children know, listen, black baby, when you're out here with your non-black friends, you got to be on your P's and Q's and really you shouldn't be out here by yourself with your non-black friends just kind of hanging out. Because when things go left to keep it a buck, they ain't going to have your back. Let's just let's keep it real. When things go down, your non-black friends ain't going to really have your back. The ones who's going to have your back, your black buddies are going to cut for you. Even other black strangers who are FBA, when you go somewhere, that's why I don't like, especially I, I, you never send your children around a bunch of non-black people. You don't send your kids around a bunch of non-black people. And let me tell you something. I've always said this. When I go somewhere and I'm the only black person or whatever, the first thing I look for is another FBA somewhere. And I say FBA because I don't want no tether. And a tether, if I see a bad hairline and some high water pants, I'm like, oh, Lord, shit, I'm in danger. That, that tether, if something go down with these white folks, the tether is going to help them. So when I go somewhere, I try to make eye contact with another FBA. Because we understand, we kind of give each other the nod, like, yeah, I see you, brother, and I see you, too. If something go down, I got you. You're going to be good. That's all I need. All I need is one other FBA in the room, and I'm good. We give each other that head nod. That's what the head nod is for. When black folks acknowledge each other, that's what we're doing. We're letting each other know. If something go down, I got you. You dig? If something go down, I got you. But that poor girl went in that McDonald's with her non-black friends and they sat there and let that big old big back behemoth jump on that girl and they didn't do anything but film. Nobody in that store did anything. And then from what I understand, at the school, the kids at the school are passing the video around as a sport because the girl says she's kind of complaining about that. They're kind of laughing and joking about it. Even in the comment section of um, the news story, there's a lot of white supremacists and anti-black people in the comment section actually justifying that little girl getting beat up like that. They were like, yeah, that's what she gets. A lot of these adult anti-black racists, they think that's perfectly fine that that little girl got beat up like that. You're dealing with cowards. This is why we're not cutting for all of these other groups. We're not going to sit here and play the minority coalition because these people come from these failed cultures where they're cowards in their homeland. They marginalize the black people that are there. And then they want to come over here with their same coward mentality and try to marginalize us. You understand? So, yeah. Yeah. That coward, degenerate, tether mentality, that's why we're delineating from that. That's why we're not playing that whole minority coalition thing. Because these people, when things go down, they're not riding for us. Ain't no minority coalition, dude. You got to hang with some black folks. You understand? And... Again, when people sit up here and see the Glorillas and the Sukihanas and the Sexy Reds on TV and on the radio every day talking about licking folks' asses and all of that, they sit here and on a subconscious level, they think, well, yeah, that little black girl deserves to get beat up because I see Sukihana in her. Forget about her honor roll status. I still see Sexy Red. You see? We think that we get degrees and we get um, um, academic accolades that white supremacist society will see us differently than they see what you see on screen. It doesn't work like that. Let me tell you, sisters, all you sisters out there with PhDs and degrees and all of that stuff, 
that sounds good and and that's and I'm not knocking that that you're supposed to have that but I want you to understand with your degrees with your accolades some of you might have doctorates some of you might be lawyers some of you might be some of you might be judges some of you might be PhDs some of you might have all the letters and the academic accolades that anyone can get but let me tell you something when you walk in a room with your white colleagues they see this on the screen I want y'all to understand that and that's not a reflection of you I'm just letting you know what their mindset is a lot of you sisters out here and black men too let me I'm, black men too but I want y'all to understand Black women, whatever accolades you have, you can be dressed like a church lady or whatever. You can be the most conservative woman. You can be have a wife. I mean, you can be a wife and have children and a husband at home and um, all types of degrees. When you walk in a room, them white supremacists see this on the screen. That's what they see. No matter what you do, that's what they see because they project their own image of blackness onto you. So that's what they see. You think, okay, yeah, I ain't like the Sukehanas and all of them because yeah, I got a doctorate. I'm not out here grinding on the floor. But that's what they think. And let me tell you something. When these white co-workers and your colleagues go home and talk about you, this is how they describe you. They make it seem like you come to work with your ass out. You might come to work with church clothes on every day. But they go home, you know, Bob, I, I got a black coworker, and she comes to work with skin tight clothes on. She's dressed like a stripper. She, she reminds me of Glorilla. I mean, God, she's such a whore bag. She's trying to get a promotion. This is how they describe you. This is how they describe him. And with black men, they see a giant penis. No matter what you act like, no matter how you act, they see a big giant penis. That's what they see when they see a black man come in. It's that simple. They see a sex object. They see us as sexual objects. Yeah. This is why them white women, them white supervisor, them white women always trying to get up on them black men behind closed doors. There was one, um, wasn't there one um, franchise owner on the East Coast, this white woman was trying to make some of the black men lay up with her, and the black men had to have a class action lawsuit against this white woman. Was it for one of them sports teams? If I'm not mistaken, I think it was for one of them sports teams. The the white woman who was the general manager or something, she was in there buck breaking niggas, and they had to file a class action suit on her. What was that white woman's name, guys? What was that white woman's name? Yeah, as a bunch of them had to file a suit like, damn, she making us do something funny for money, guys. Damn. You dig? But yeah, that, that's how they look at us. And we better understand the game out here and how these people try to marginalize us. And we can't go for the okie doke. We don't leave our children vulnerable. It's very important that we look out for our babies because our children end up getting thrown under the bus in situations like this. So we got to be very clear and very careful about letting our kids go out here and getting caught up in the game. And another thing we got to look out for, too, um, right now, election season is popping Election season is popping, ladies and gentlemen, and um, they had Kamala Harris. You know, your girl Kamala Harris was back at it again. So Kamala Harris had a hip hop party, <clears throat> excuse me, and she's out. She gets black every um, election cycle. Every election cycle, she gets black. Right after the election cycle, she's back to being an Indian American. But when it's time for votes, then she puts on a little tacky um, bootleg fashion over outfit and runs around and starts doing her little janky, stiff ass dancing and starts talking about her, her hip hop collection and all of that stuff. And we're supposed to fall in line and go for that. And we're saying no. 
black voters are being a little more sophisticated. We're not being emotional. We're we're not going for the okie doke. We're saying, hey, we're going to have to get some of them tangibles. So she was out here dancing a jig and doing all of that stuff. And people were clowning. They see that the polling numbers are pretty low for they know that there's a problem. And now people are running around here. The, the Democrats got their shills out here talking about, hey, why do black people hate Kamala so much? So they're getting their Democratic shills and their LGBT shills to try to shame us again. They're doing the shaming tactics to try to shame us into supporting Kamala. And then they come out here and do the same thing they do. They start lying about all the stuff she's done for black society, which is all a damn lie. Now, let's go. Let's look at some of the lies. Let's let's look at some of the um, the usual suspects. This Reese woman who's um, a part of Kamala Harris's online troll team. Oh, no, this woman has me blocked. You know, I'm, I'm public enemy number one with these folks. They always attack me first. But so here's this woman here doing the lies for Kamala, talking about all the stuff Kamala allegedly did. And it's all cap, ladies and gentlemen. It's all cap. Hold on. This Reese Colbert, she's always on Rolling Show, that whole boule crowd. But hold on. Who apparently don't pay attention to the second rank. Hold on. So all you, we ain't seen Kamala since we did a Joe Head. That's people who apparently don't pay attention to the second ranking person in the country until she hits the blogs, dent to the virus thing. Let me take advantage of having your attention to fill you in on what you've been missing. 400,000 black businesses were eradicated under Trump. Vice President Kamala Harris recently announced over $125 million for funding for small black businesses. That's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie. There's no funding for small black businesses. It's minority businesses. It ain't black. That's This is a lie, okay? This is why you shouldn't support these people because they'll come out here and just tell a straight up lie. There is no funding for small black businesses. They got a minority program, a disadvantaged community program. It is not a black business program. We don't get none of that money because they have to gatekeep the money. They rig it so that the money is filtered through white LGBT groups and immigration groups. The money don't even trickle down to us. So this is a lie. What she just said was a flat out lie, guys. Okay? This is a lie. Not a platinum scam, but actual money that you can take or get from the bank. This country has never given a damn about black women dying during childbirth, three times more likely than our counterparts. But Vice President Kamala Harris does, and that's why she has elevated the issue to the White House for the first time ever. Okay, what well, she didn't elevate the issue. What the hell does that mean? That's that means nothing. That means she ain't done nothing. I've elevated the issue. What the hell does that mean? That means she's done nothing. See, they these are this is the, the white DNC writing out their talking points. They're writing out their talking points and giving to their Negro shills. This don't mean nothing. Some of y'all try to ask people don't believe that black women issues are black issues. So let me tell you that she has also engaged black men specifically, bringing black men to the White House, small business owners to talk about entrepreneurship. She what? What? Inviting black men to the White House to talk about entrepreneurship? The hell is that? This is to talk. She invited some niggas to the White House to talk about entrepreneurship. What? The, what is that? So she gave niggas some words. So she came, she invited us to the White House to give some words. So nothing, again, she did nothing. This is a roundabout way of saying nothing. She's also engaged black men around mental health. She engaged black men around mental That means nothing. That means she did nothing. Telling people saying nobody cares when HBCUs are receiving bomb threats, but Vice President Kamala Harris actually did. And that's why she announced safety grants for HBCUs who are receiving those threats. Safety grants, how? What, what do you mean she's going to give safety grants to HBCUs? Where? She announced safety grants, and these HBCUs are full of white, non FBA, and Hispanic people. So that ain't for us. You got all these other groups who's getting all of the HBCU benefits. So no, that ain't for us. Go ahead. Who are receiving those threats. 10 million people have gotten access to affordable broadband thanks to Kamala Harris's efforts leading the broadband portfolio in the Biden-Harris administration. It oh, and? 
What does that have to do with black? What, what is that for us? It's too damn much to send these kids to child care. That's why Vice President Kamala Harris recently announced a rule of change that will lower costs for many people across the country. <laughs> Boy, this is this is the best they can do, family. She thinks she can talk fast. See, she thinks she's going to talk fast about these damn nothing burgers and just keep spewing out a bunch of nothing ass nonsense and think, okay, we're going to be dazzled by all of this stuff that Kamala Harris is doing. But when you think about it, she, she's doing it real fast so that you don't think, well, like, hey, that ain't really nothing. That's why I'm pausing it. It's nothing. She's proving that Kamala Harris ain't doing nothing for us. These are nothing burgers. Hold on. To help black homeowners, Vice President Kamala Harris has stepped up to lead a task force that is aimed at eliminating bias in the appraisal homeownership process. That ain't for us. That ain't for us. That's for LGBT immigrants, Asians, and all of, all of these other people. That helps them. That's not specifically for us. We're not going to let them play this game where they have these lift all minority programs and then say, hey, look, look at what we're doing for the black community. No, these are lift all programs for everybody. This is not for us. These people are pathological damn liars, man. So if you fix your face to say, we ain't seen Kamala, this is what they're trying to do to get our votes, it's election time, now you've been informed. Yeah, we've been informed that you're a pathological damn liar and she's done a bunch nothing burgers these are nothing burgers family all of these so-called programs they're not for us they'll i, I told y'all that's the con game that they run um we're going through this right now here with the museum they'll sit up and tell you about all of these programs for black people but when we try to apply for these things we get deprioritized because all of these other groups are getting the funds I'm telling you what we're experiencing now. We have a museum where we're helping black people in the community out of our own pocket, and we can't get a grant from the city or the state or the federal government, nothing, because all of these funds are tricked up and rigged so that it's filtered through the immigrants, through the white LGBT, and some of these other damn groups before we even get a piece of it. And by the time we're supposed to get something, it's all exhausted. The funds are exhausted. We're going through this right now, family. Don't let these folks run that game on you. And then they have to do Jason Lee from Hollywood Unlocked. He came out to try to shame, to do some shaming tactics about why People ain't really rocking with Kamala Harris like that. All right, so let's let's look at his shaming tactics. Hold on. This is Jason Lee from Hollywood Unlocked, biracial LGBT dude. Now listen to his shaming tactics. They they send these people out, and there's they always send these sassy folks out here to try to shame us and name call and all of that. That other dude that they get. Um, that other sassy dude, I forgot his name, Too Raw, Too Real. They always send him out every election cycle to curse out the black community and read off these nothing burger list of what Kamala Harris has done for the community and try to shame us. We're not going for the shaming tactics no more. You're not going to insult us into supporting Kamala Harris talking about how black she is. All of a sudden she gets real black and we're supposed to support her performative blackness every election cycle. That's not gonna work. Now listen to this, hold on, hold on. What up everybody, it's me, Jason. Look, this past weekend, you know, I went to the vice president's house for the hip hop, uh, 50th anniversary hip hop party at her house. And I took this picture, you've seen it, but it wasn't the picture that I wanna to talk to about, it's the video that's been seen around the world that I took, this video right here. Uh, if you've seen it. That video. Now, I shared that video of the vice president. I took that video of the vice president and I posted it in a way that everybody was still and not give me credit because I didn't want the credit. What I wanted was for the world to see it and 20 million views later, it's clear that you have. I've been looking at all the comments over the last couple of days of everybody that's had stuff to say from white folks to Republicans, to black people, to, to white people about what black people should feel about it. I've been looking at all the comments and my only question is, why do y'all hate her so much? 
Why do y'all hate her so much? What has Kamala Harris done to you that's made you hate her so much? Oh, well, n nothing. She's done nothing for the black community. Out here in California, we've always felt a way about her. She was locking brothers up left and right, um, locking black women up left and right, and laughing and caca -ca and kiki -ki about it. So yeah, out here in California, y'all not going to run that game on us. We know her pedigree. See, she has a, a history out here, and we've been not rocking with Kamala Harris out here. So that's one thing. And also her telling us what she ain't going to damn do for black people. This right here, this is why we don't rock with her. We're giving her the same energy right here. Hold on. This we right here. We don't benefit black people? No. I'm not going to sit here and say I'm going to do something that's only going to benefit black people. No. I'm not going to sit here and say I'm going to do something that's only going to benefit black people. No. So that right there. All right. So let me play the rest. Hold on. She... Grew up in Oakland, California, which is not an easy city to grow up in. And, and what does that mean? What, what the hell does that mean? She grew up in Oakland. Well, and there's a lot of Asians out there in Oakland, too. There's a lot of other Asians like Kamala out there in Oakland, too. So what does that mean? As a mixed biracial child, which I can tell you is a mixed breed, it ain't easy. And it ain't easy for having people with dual allegiances try to represent us and misrepresent us. It's not easy for foundational black Americans to have people who kind of look like they got some melanin, but in their mind, they have contempt for black society because they blame the melanated genes for stopping them from being white. So it ain't easy to have those type of Negroes lurking among us, working against us. It's not easy for us to deal with that either. She became an attorney. She became a female attorney general in... Yeah, so that she could help lock Negroes up. That's not a flex. California, working under a Republican administration. Which she wasn't. It wasn't a Republican administration, but go ahead. She then went on to become a state senator that we all love because she was in their ass about stuff over there on the Hill. And then um, No, she was in their ass about letting her get more access to locking up niggas, but go ahead. And got elected as the first female and the first black female vice president of the United States. Oh, no, no, no. Because when she got elected, they start immediately talking about she's the first Indian American. And right there, as a black person, we don't get to change our blackness like we change clothes. It don't work like that. One week, she's Indian American. The next week, when it's election time, then you're black. And your blackness consists of you just dancing around in an afflicted, corny way to pander to people to get you some votes, but 364 days of the year, you're East Indian. That's not the black experience, sir. And somehow she ain't shit. She ain't shit. Nope, she ain't she shit. She locked up all the black men in California. Really? Yes, yes. She locked up a lot of black when men. When I read, she's doing nothing for the culture. She's doing nothing for black people. Yes, that's true. She's not. Really? Really, yeah. She's she's bad for the for the White House. She's just she's taking us backwards. We're gonna vote for Trump. Nobody said that. Okay. Nobody said really? that. Really? One. Y'all don't want to eradicate the police department for people giving tickets to you for speeding in the twenty-five mile zone. You don't get mad at the police. You get mad at the lawmaker because the police didn't make the law that says you can't. What what is he talking about? This is babble. This is sassy babble. This doesn't Drive make faster sense. in that area. Yet, as Attorney General, for enforcing the three strikes law that was created by Pete Wilson, who was a white racist in California, makes her the bad guy? Half. You know, the Clintons were, were part of that. What, what is he talking about? That was some Democrat stuff. Them three strikes. That was the Clintons. What is he talking about? Is he trying to put three strikes on the Republicans? What is he talking about? Boy, this is Democratic Shield 101. This is Democratic Shield 101. We remember Hillary Clinton and those guys running around here talking about, yeah, we got to bring those people to heal and yeah, yeah, yeah. We, re we remember the Clintons out here with the draconian ass laws when it came to locking black people up. What is he talking about? 
what in the world is this man talking about? Okay, let, let me play the rest. Let me play the rest. But yeah, the three strikes laws, that was under the Clinton administration. All right, but go ahead. The y'all that talk about politics don't vote. The other half don't understand how the law works. And those of you that are talking about the three strikes law don't even live in California. So you don't even know how our laws work. Then you say she's not doing enough for the country. She's not the president. She's the vice president. But when you look at what the president is doing, he's done a lot for the country. He just ain't on TV every day. Ain't nobody saying that. Y'all making up straw man arguments. They're talking about it. Why don't you know? Because their teams aren't communicating the best and we're not paying attention the most. But what I will say is that when I looked at all the commentary of Kamala's dancing at the White House, at the vice president's party, it really, it really disappointed me. There was a lot of great comments, like Black Twitter, a lot of great comments, people saying Auntie Kamala and this- No, Auntie nothing. No, no, stop with that Auntie Kamala bullshit. That's tether talk. Y'all tethers be trying to sound like FBAs. Go ahead, Auntie. No, that ain't nobody's Auntie. My Auntie ain't East Indian. That's nobody's Auntie. We don't relate to her like that. Y'all stop that. That's y'all performative tethers who do that type of shit. Kamala Harris don't give no Auntie. She's nobody's Auntie. All right, let's stop that. She's not Auntie Kamala. This is the Kamala we want to see. And I've told the vice president, I've told her team, this is what people want to see. But it was the racist, white supremacist uprooting of hatred towards a black woman that I saw from the right and the complicit behavior of sleep black folks who were participating in it that disappointed me. There we go. Come on with that, that anti-black hate from the biracial LGBT community. That's where this is going. There we go. Let it come on out. A lot of these guys, man, a lot of these folks have contempt for black society. A lot of these folks have utter contempt for black society. And it's coming on out. Now, as a black gay entrepreneur, when white people hate on me or tell me I'm not ready or not big enough or this or that or whatever, or they minimize who I am, I, I, it's, it is what it is. I take it on the chin and I keep killing it. But when black hate happens, it hurts more. It hurts more when black people hate on you. Black, black people hate what? Hating on an East Indian who comes from a culture of anti-black hate? Black folks have an epidemic in its culture and community in the United States that we need to understand. And that is the inferiority complex to white people and whiteness and self-hate. Who self? She's not ourself. Kamala Harris doesn't represent self hate because she's not a foundational Black American. That ain't self hate. We ain't rocking with her because of self love. We love ourselves well enough to not let a non FBA tether who has contempt for us, who comes from a culture of anti Black racism, to act as our representative. That's called self-love. Kamala Harris is not our representative. She's not a foundational black American. We're not letting any person with a little piece of melanin somewhere in them act as our representative. Her culture from East India is anti-black from top to bottom. Yeah, that's a projection. Come on. In the black community. Some of y'all niggas don't like Kamala Harris just simply because she's great. Mm. Now, does this sound like somebody who's comfortable with black society? This, the contempt for black society is coming out here. Y'all niggas, what kind of voting strategy is this? Now, this is who the Democrats are pushing out here to, to shame us into voting. Y'all niggas better get it together. This, this guy sounds like low-key, this is white supremacy. This sounds like a white supremacist right here. That's the white side talking. Some of y'all niggas talk about you don't like her or don't support her, but you ain't done nothing to research her agenda or what she's doing. We know what she's doing. We have we don't have to research her agenda. We just have to listen to her. I'm not gonna sit here and say I'm gonna do something that's only gonna benefit black people. No. That's the agenda. I'm not gonna sit here and say I'm gonna do something that's only gonna benefit black people. No. no. I'm not gonna sit here and say I'm gonna do something that's only gonna benefit black people. No. no. That's her agenda. We know her agenda. She told us. Stop acting like there's some kind of deep 
document that we got to do a deep dive in. No, she told us with her chest what she ain't going to damn do for us. She didn't say this to no other group. Kamala Harris didn't say that nonsense to any other group. She said that to us. Hold on. The white folks, when they saw her dancing at this party, it was only a three and a half hour party, by the way, celebrating the global impact of hip hop during its 50th anniversary. The white folks say, why was the border czar partying with the rappers? And then black folks would have been saying, if she didn't do it, why is she ain't acknowledging black music and the impact it's had on culture? How is Kamala Harris? Okay, when she talked about hip hop, and I think this is enough, this is enough. No. When Kamala Harris talked about hip hop, she omitted foundational black Americans. When she talked about the cultural impact of hip hop, she started talking about African culture, Afro-Caribbean, Latino. She didn't even mention us. That woman got on that stage and literally erased foundational black Americans from something that we created. That's why we're doing this documentary now. But that's enough of that. I'm not going to play no more because, again, this whole thing where they're trying to shame us into acknowledging and respecting Kamala Harris's performative blackness that she puts on around election season, that's not working no more. These straw man arguments, no. That woman is not a foundational black American, and we're not really keen on letting non-foundational black Americans represent us. That ain't self-hate, that's self-love. We love ourselves enough to say, hey, we don't want you people misrepresenting us. All that, yeah, she smoked with Tupac and all of that stuff. No, y'all not gonna run that game. She smoked, she smoked a joint listening to Tupac. Yeah, your blackness, again, her blackness, it involves doing degenerate stuff. Her wearing a tacky outfit, doing a corny dance. Her talking about having some hot sauce or whatever. Her talking about smoking something to Tupac. And no, that's not what blackness is. That's not the extent of blackness. See, family, we're wising up and FBA family, don't let nobody shame you. You're doing the right thing because now these people, they're scattering. They don't know what to do because they're not able to manipulate you no more. We have woken up and we said, hey, wait a minute. We can't let non-FBA people act as our representatives because too many non-FBA people, historically, they've come around and we've let them in because they got a little melanin and they've come in and just undermined everything that we tried to put together. They've been doing this stuff for decades, family. We got to watch who we support. And there's a lot of folks who are non-FBA tethers that we don't even realize. And then when we look back at their work, we're like, oh, damn, that's why nothing got popping. See, we got to start looking at what the problem is, why we don't get certain things popping. And we got to look and see who are the people undermining this stuff. Let's be real. When you look at the record industry, let's go to the record industry. Look at some of the A&R people that you have there. You got a lot of white people work at these labels and tethers working as A&R people. When you go to some of these networks, some of these so-called black networks or whatever, the, the people programming this stuff, and I'm, I'm telling you from my experience, from dealing with them, these are non-FBA people. So this is why you see this filth that you see on screen. When you see some of the hip hop shows, look at the people putting it on. Mona Scott and those people. These are non Mona Scott is Haitian. These are non FBA people putting this filth on. Showing this image of us. Look at look at the people who's putting this stuff out there. Let's keep it a buck. We got to look and see who's doing all of this stuff. When we start letting people in our circles back in the 60s and 70s, like Shirley Chisholm, we were like, okay, that's a black woman. Bring her in. Yeah, she's, we got the civil rights movement popping. Bring Shirley Chisholm in. I think Shirley Chisholm ran for president and the black community was very supportive of her. That was a black woman. But the thing is, she started talking about gender stuff. She started bringing in some LGBT stuff and some of the feminist stuff, which came into undermine us that was bringing and trojan horsing in some of the white feminists to come in and leech off of our movement and benefit off of it shirley chisholm is a tether caribbean tether 
You understand? We got to look at certain people historically who who came around and did real weird stuff. Y'all remember in the 90s, C. Dolores Tucker and the, speaking of Tupac. For some of y'all who might not be old enough to remember, there was this woman who was um what the hell was C. Dolores Tucker's position? She was like kind of one of these boule types. This black lady, C. Dolores Tucker, who was really backed up by some white Republicans. She was backed up by this white dude named William Bennett. A lot of folks don't know that. She was kind of clicked in. She was a Democrat, but she was clicked in with some white money. They sent her to be their front person to attack black rappers. Um, if you listen to a lot of records in the 90s, a lot of rappers mentioned C. Dolores Tucker and they clowned her in their music. But she really went after Tupac. She was trying to sue Tupac. She was really going after our brother. C. Dolores Tucker became a thorn in the side of a lot of um, our, our foundational black American artists and black artists. Yet Was she a senator? She was a congresswoman, right? Yeah, yeah. She, she was basically a damn nobody who basically got old and made her claim to fame going after rappers, particularly Tupac. And Tupac clowned her and she tried to sue Tupac. She was taking a dragon, our brother, in and out of court, talking about emotional distress. They threw her stuff out eventually. But yeah, she was a slumlord in Philly, by the way. She was doing all of this performative finger wagging. Oh, y'all black people, y'all black men is misogynistic. And she was a damn slumlord. Yeah, she was like some kind of front person for the NAACP. She did the whole thing about her. I used to march with Dr. King and all, all of that bullshit. So she made her bones acting as a front person for the white supremacists going after black artists. She went after Snoop. Did y'all know see Dolores Tucker was a damn tether? She's Bahamian. A lot of folks didn't even know that. Her family was from the Bahamas. She wasn't even FBA. This is what we're saying. This was another non-FBA tether trying to get her, her comeuppance off of black folks and using this whole, well, we got to protect the black girls and the women. Uh, Tarana Burke does that. That's another Caribbean tether who goes out here. We got to protect the black women. What she, C. Dolores Tucker was using Tupac and Snoop and trying to denigrate them and shame them to get Time Warner and Death Row Records to give her some money. She was not only clout chasing, she was trying to get money from these record labels. She was trying to shame them by whooping on and, and demonizing the black artists so that she could get a bag. She wanted the, the, the record executives to break her off and to let her become some kind of music distributor. Yeah, there was a lawsuit. I think Death Row filed against her. But the point is, that was another goddamn tether who was shitting on the black people in Philadelphia as a slumlord. You understand? Yeah, she did. She yeah, she had a bird face. She had a, that, that weird bird face on her ass. You understand? The, the, the tether classes, they've been undermining us, man, for so long. You understand? This is why we are now saying, hey, wait, we got to look at people's paperwork, man. That's why we're saying we, we can't sit here co-signing everybody. We can't do that. We have to look at everybody's paperwork. Too many of these non-FBA folks come around us and they do things to undermine us. You dig? That, that, that tether class has been a problem for a long time. So now they want to cry foul that we're calling everybody out. Now, we're not letting, this is why the Kamala Harris, we're not letting you come among us dancing your way out of the bullshit no 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 we're calling you out and you we're saying you ma'am are not a representative of us we've had too many of the shirley chisholms we didn't have too many of the the c dolores tuckers and all of these people come among us misrepresenting us undermining us too many of the candace owens and the tarana burks and the the all of the others the barack obamas we've had too much of that Coming among us, we're sitting here propping you up and you're doing everything you can to undermine us. Some of the policies that now are harming us, they were put up, um, they were put in place because of Obama. Obama didn't do a damn thing for us, but he'd sat here and 
got the DACA programs and got all of these things popping for these other groups to be elevated over us. And now what we see, they're coming over here beating up our damn kids. They done sat here elevating these people left and right. And all we get is our children getting beat up by these damn people. And then they want to shame us into supporting them. And then when we say, hey, man, y'all need to give us some protection. Y'all let over all of these weirdos. Y'all didn't open the borders. Y'all didn't vet nobody. Y'all gave all our tax dollars to these, these non-citizens. And they're violent and hateful towards us. They're jumping on our kids. And we're saying, hey, give us a damn crime bill or something. And then y'all want to shame us because we ain't going for the dance moves that they're doing? Nah. We're not playing that game. They hate the fact that we have stood on our square as far as our lineage. That's why they, us looking at our lineage, boy, that thing, that that took a curveball on their ass. They didn't see that coming. They didn't see us standing on our lineage like this. They weren't expecting that. That was a curveball to them because that has thwarted a lot of their plans us acknowledging, wait a minute, we need to start looking out for our lineage because we are a unique ethnic lineage. Why do you think they always attacking FBAs? Oh, you FBAs, y'all niggas are a cult. You niggas are, they keep trying to redefine it because see, we turned around and defined ourselves. We're not letting you call us a minority coalition. We're not letting you call us African-American. That's them defining us. We defined ourselves. We defined ourselves and that's where the power is. So now they keep trying and everybody wants to be black when it's convenient. And we're saying, okay, you can play that game all you want, but you're not FBA. See, you can't play that with FBA. When we start saying we're foundation of black Americans, see, you can't remix that. See, they can play this little Kamala's black when she feels like it game, but you can never claim to be FBA at no point. You understand? And that's what we're looking at. We're looking to see who's FBA around here because a lot of these people try to be black when it's convenient. I've heard interviews of Fat Joe and, and they got him hosting the BET Hip Hop Awards next month, by the way. The Black Entertainment Hip Hop Awards. They got a white Latino and Joe has said he's white and then he'll do interviews saying he's black. And I've heard other people say this. Other Puerto Rican cats do this too. This is why so many people are shaking in their boots about this documentary we're working on because this is another con game of them trying to claim um, hip hop is black and Latino because they don't have any proof or any facts or any receipts showing how they Latinos created hip hop. They know good and well they didn't create hip hop. So they run the little word game on us. They'll sit here and I've heard that Derek Cologne dude do this. And I've heard a couple of them Puerto Ricans do this. When you say, well, hip hop was created by black folks. Some of the Latinos will be like, well, yeah, it, yeah. Okay. It's created by black people. And, um, as a Puerto Rican, I got a black abuela and, or, um, technically I'm black too. So that means that, yeah, I'm a part of, the creation of hip hop being black and Latino, but I am black now I'm black, but I'm Latino. So based on what y'all said, blacks and Latinos did create hip hop because I'm black and I'm Latino too. See, that's the little loophole they be trying to use, man. I'm telling you, they're using all types of reaches. And this is how they've been kind of running the, the little scam of blacks and Latinos created hip hop. Now us, we're coming along saying, you know what? Hip hop was created by foundational black Americans. Now they're panicking. Now they're like, oh, wait a minute. Now, oh, wait, hold on. Now that that's divisive. That's why they're so butthurt with this documentary that I'm doing. Because now we're using FBA. To, you, you don't have no wiggle room no more now. Now you ain't got no wiggle room to finesse your way into it now. That's why, the, family, we haven't even put the trailer out and these people are panicking over this documentary we're doing. 
people are sitting around on pins and needles about this damn documentary that we're doing. Y'all don't understand how butthurt these people are and they don't even, they ain't even seen one screenshot of the movie yet. Just the fact that they know we're doing it and the focal point is going to be on foundational black American culture. They know the jig is up now. You can't, you can't wiggle yourself into that. You can't see. That's the good thing about FBA. You can't remix the shit. It's a very definitive term. You cannot remix it. So they're like, shit, the niggas got us. Damn it. And in this movie, we're proving from top to damn bottom that hip hop, every single element was a foundational black American creation. No Caribbean, no Latino, no African, none of that. Every single element from top to bottom was a creation of foundational black Americans. And we're going to prove it from top to bottom. And they know we're going to prove it. We're going to stop these damn lies and you're not going to wiggle, wiggle yourself into the, the narrative. You niggas are divisive. Well, well, Hip hop is for everybody. Oh, no, no, they copping please already. No, 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 no. We're going to get this truth out here. We're going to get this truth out here for real, for real. And you cannot try to remix FBA. That's why they try to denigrate it. FBA is a cult these niggas are xenophobic because you can't ingratiate yourself into it. And we defined ourselves. You think? And got on code about defining ourselves. That's why they're so salty about it. But I digress, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, man, let me get up out of here, man. It's been real. I've been on here for a long time, chopping it up with the family, man. I appreciate everybody for tuning in. Um, more root work is coming. We got the root work deodorant coming. We got some more in stock next week. So y'all stay tuned. Everybody, if you can go to hiddenhistorymuseum.com, everybody, please make a donation to the Hidden History Museum today. Please go to hiddenhistorymuseum.com. If you can make a recurring Donation to the museum, that's going to help us out a lot because we're going through a lot of red tape out here in Los Angeles with the museum. So your contributions are greatly appreciated and that helps us do our thing. It's been real. I think we had a great conversation, family. Um, if you have not subscribed to this channel, subscribe to the channel now and hit that bell notification. And I thank folks for tuning in. Papiakute and Lola Vuve to the family. You guys have a great, great week.